Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Bevan Clare, and I'll be your MC for today. And welcome to the Free Herbalism Project from Mountain Rose Herbs. Would somebody be kind enough to just go ahead and let me know that you can see me or hear me in the chat? Okay, good. I see lots of hellos. We're great. Okay. Yay. Wow, so many people. I gotta stop looking at that. Um, so I'm Bevan Clara. I'm, I'm so excited to be the MC for this event. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, Mountain Rose Herbs generously puts on the free herbalism project events twice per year. And there's some complicating matters this year. So we're lucky enough that we get to all participate in this. And normally this is a free event for the Oregon community who is close by, but this year it's for anyone who can be here. It'll be recorded and sent out. And I'm excited about this for a few reasons. One of them is that this is a live event. Um, and I know that, you know, we're still just looking on these screens and that might seem a little bit different than like, a live event where we can hug and do all of these things. But I think one of the things that's so powerful about all of this is that, you know, we are all doing this right now together and we're all connected. And it made me think about, you know, that you can see these big trees in the background. They're real trees, but they're not actually in the background. I am in the, um, I'm in the basement hiding from my kids. And so we are, but if you think about these trees and you think about wherever you are, I can tell you that anywhere down below your feet, there are roots. Um, it doesn't really matter what kind of land you're on or where you are, there are roots down there. And so I don't know if you can put your feet on the ground for a minute, not necessarily the ground ground, but just put them down and go ahead and feel that connection with those roots. So just so you can picture some light or crazy wires or you know branches or roots or anything coming down and finding those roots that are down underground where you are, you know, connecting to every, all these other roots. And when we do this, and this is how plants communicate, this is how trees communicate, this is how forests and ecosystems communicate, is down underground, you know, they find each other and they use all sorts of messaging and, and they connect and function together. And so today, all around the world, we are, we can feel that connection through those roots, that, that my roots in Maryland, where I am, that are outside, are connecting to roots in Virginia and DC and those in the Midwest and those on the West Coast and all the way up through Canada. And, and you know, there's, there's roots in the ocean too. So we have plants there, you know, we're, so we're all connected. So feel that and know that today we're part of that rhizomatic root system that exists as we do this together. Um, this is our shared experience. So we're in this kind of funky, crazy, plant-like circle stretched across the world today. So today we have a bunch of things that are gonna be really fun. We're going to hear from Rising Appalachia, woohoo! And we're going to hear a little bit about some of our favorite herb nonprofits and what they're up to. We're going to hear about aromatherapy from a certified aromatherapist, Christine Rice. And you'll have the opportunity to view a fantastic plant walk with Steven Yeager um, and get to experience some of that plantiness as well. So lots of fun things in store for you. I wanted to give you a little reminder that, um, that we are herbalists and musicians and earth lovers, but we're not necessarily like super fancy tech people. So if you came here because you were expecting a massively high tech and seamless process, you're probably not going to get it. But if you came here for fun and a lot of love and community and learning and experiencing, then we promise that that's what you'll get. So we're going to go ahead and um, start with our first awesome thing that's going to happen today. And that is, we are going to hear from Rising Appalachia. And I'm sure you're all super excited about this. Rising Appalachia is a musical group composed of two sisters, Chloe and Leah, and they're from the South, from the Atlanta area. And they use a lot of different types of tools and instruments in their work as healers and musicians, um, but their vocal instruments might be the ones you're most familiar with. They're also going to be coming to us from two different countries, so from Costa Rica and North 
Carolina or, you know, another <laughs> North Carolina in the US. And, um, and, you know, they bring with them not just like a little music to hear, but they bring with them a message of resilience and hope and all the things that we really need right now. And so we're really excited about hearing them. I don't know if we'll get to hear anything new. I know that they have a, a whole bunch of new music that's out there that you can find. And um, I see Chloe appearing right now from North Carolina. Hi, Chloe. Hi. Thank you for having us. So exciting. We are going to just um, sort of, my sister and I are both here and we're gonna just round robin this musical session. So I'll play a song, Leo will play a song and we'll do some uh, talking about what we're involved in currently and maybe some of our own tools of resilience in these strange times. Awesome, um, and I will be back after you're done. Yeah, you. thank you, Bevan. Yeah, so we're happy to be here with all of you amazing herbalists and aspiring herbalists. Um, we are also herbalists in training and have been for quite a while, and so now we're able to to do a little bit more of that work now that we're not on tour until who knows when. Um, so I'm gonna play a song and I'll pass it to Leah. This is a song of ours called Harmonize. It's from our new album, Ley Lines. Um, yeah, here we go. harmonize for you. I'm going to pass the torch over to Leah to share some music and get you another song. Thanks for tuning in. 
Hey folks, hopefully you can hear me all right. Uh, this is the new Rising Appalachia way. <laughs> we harmonize muted because if we harmonize live, there's delay. So, you know, we just belt our, our secondary parts out and, and hear each other's voices a little more. I'm Leah. Um, Chloe and I are sisters, same mama, same papa. Uh, deeply embedded in the world of folk music collection, collection and, and the gathering of tools, the gathering of um, stories and the gathering of myth. And the world of, of herbal medicine has been a huge part of our lives, our wellness and our well-being. Um, it's been an enormous part of our touring life for those of you that have seen us. You know, we got the good fortune of being the Monopoly Herbalism Conference Band for a few years, and it was such a treasure. Um, and now I think that we're not able to tour very much. We are all finding ourselves really deeply back into the work of actually being in the ground and on the ground um, and in the dirt. So we put together a small herbal line last year uh, with a, an herbal company called Anima Mundi, and we did a line that put together herbal medicine and our song lyrics. And I am quarantined here in Central America in Costa Rica by a series of interesting decisions and good luck, but also it's equally as bizarre here as anywhere. Um, but I find myself in the, in the high country of Central America, in Costa Rica, um, and I'm living next door to the Anama Mundi community uh, and the woman that ran our herbal medicine project. So little tiny synchronicities. Uh, she and Chloe and I had never met in person. Uh, and here we are neighbors in the quarantine. So it's been really interesting times. And I brought a few instruments with me. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm, I'm in an open air space. Um, but I brought my, my Irish drum and my banjo. I was lucky enough to have a lot of instruments here with me um, because I came down for some, some healing time uh, and health and wellness before a big tour and I did not know what kind of extended healing time I would get. So um, it's really nice to hear from all of you and, and hear and see where all of you are from. I, I also said that if anyone has questions, send them over in the Q&A section and we'll keep an eye on that while we swap instruments. And um, I'm gonna do a song called Caminando, which is written by an Argentinian activist friend of ours and uh, translates, it's, translates to mean, you know, when, roughly when you're doing your work in the world, you are walking one, one foot towards the other in the direction of sun, in the direction of liberty, in the direction of resilience, in the direction of peace, and in the direction of justice. And I think in these times that are trying and hard and tiresome and confusing and frightening, uh, there's also a massive amount of un uniting that we can do. And so I send this out to all of us to strengthen our roots, like Evan said, and to deepen our communities internationally in all of the diverse and powerful ways that we are able to build community. So. Caminando, caminando, vamos caminando hacia el sol. Caminando, caminando, vamos caminando hacia la unidad. Cantar. A mí me gusta caminar, a mí me gusta cantar. Vas haciendo, lo vas haciendo a caminar. Caminando, caminando. Vamos caminando. 
si eu sou Caminando, caminando Vamos caminando hacia la libertad Mano a mano, caminando, hombro a hombro, trabajando. Y las tierras compartiendo, libertades cosechando. Caminando, caminando. Vamos caminando hacia el sol. Caminando, caminando, vamos caminando hacia la paz. Es nutrición, queremos ser así. No el enemigo, no a la guerra, para la vida. Caminando, caminando, vamos caminando hacia el sol. so much. Hopefully you can hear that. And, um, we'll just keep passing the mic back and forth and I'll, uh, while Chloe's doing this next song, I'll look at some of your questions and answers and, and we'll just keep filling your screen with tunes while we can. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for joining Rising Appalachia in our uh, tandem Zoom screen share. So, duet. Beautiful. All right. Um, yeah, feel free to holler what you think or your questions in the chat. Yeah, happy to be here with you all. I'm going to play this song that I've been playing a lot recently. Um, and I've been, I've had the honor to be a part of some really amazing online things. You know, the online world, like uh, Bevan said, wasn't really our thing. <laughs> Um, we're so much more used to sharing our music in person and in large crowds and obviously that's all shifted so much and so I've been a part of some really beautiful gatherings and this song has been specifically potent I think right now for the times for our entire world for our bodies for our mental health um, as just a reminder of you know coming back after being bent or broken the song is called resilient and that word resilient is so important right now so while i play this i just encourage folks to think about that word in relationship to your own lives your own hearts your own families however you want to kind of digest it and think about how how you're practicing resilience perhaps how the plants are helping you practice resilience um yeah here we go <laughs> I trust the movement, I negate the chaos, uplift the negative, I'll show up at the table again and again and again, I'll close my mouth and learn to live. 
These times are poignant, the winds have shifted, it's all we can do to stay uplifted. Pipelines through backyards, wolves howling out front. Yeah, I got my crew, but truth is what I want. Realigned and on point, power to the peaceful, prayers to the waters, women at the center, all vessels open. To give and receive. Let's see the system right down to its knees. speck of dust and this bread is made from me so let's go and try our luck see i've got my roots down 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 deep. i've got my roots down 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 so what are we doing here what has been done what do you when the world comes undone my voice feels tiny and i'm sure so does yours put us all together make a mighty roll I am resilient, I trust the movement, I negate the chaos, uplift the negative, I'll show up at the table, again and again and again, I'll close my mouth and I Hey Twa, thank you all so much, that song's called Resilient. Honored to be a part of this amazing summit. I'm gonna pass it back to Leah for one last song and then we'll get to some, some talks about plants and medicine. Thank y'all. Yay, I'm answering some of your questions here um, and trying to get some information to you. So I'll send some more information in the, in the notes. Um, about the names of the songs and where to find them. And yeah, let's see. Oh, it's so cool to see where everyone is calling in from and just where you are all here from. Um, how did one of the simple question is about ley lines. Um, and if we'll, if we'll release it on vinyl and maybe well, uh, Chloe, you could reflect a little bit on the process of ley lines and recording it and the, I'd love you to just talk a little bit about the herb line and I'll just get this Sandra tuned up for my next song. Um, but the question was about ley lines and if it will release on vinyl and also along the lines of the herbal line and the song titles that went with that herb line. So maybe you can reflect on that for a minute. Can you say that question again just a little louder and hold up your mic, I can't hear you very well. Is that any better? Yeah, that's way better. Okay. What was the that question? question? Uh, there are two questions. One was about 
uh, Ley Lines, the recording of Ley Lines, and if it would be released and available on vinyl, and also about the herb line and the song titles. So if you want to just talk about that process of writing Ley Lines and the, the process of making the herb line with it, I'll get tuned up and ready. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, Rising Appalachia is a big band. Lee and I are, you know, the representatives here today, but um, we're a six piece band and we had spent the past four or five years traveling all over the world, sharing our music and just noticing that there were places of big spirit and power and energy and um, around the world that kind of had a lot of similarities to one another. And then someone mentioned the word ley lines to me as it's an actual um, theory that there's magnetic connections into different parts of the world that um, have spiritual significance. And I loved that concept as a musician. I really feel that when I travel around the world. And then, you know, we kind of took it into the sphere of how songs and how music is so intertwined in a similar way. So on Ley Lines, we have a lot of West African traditions represented, as well as Irish traditions, as well as Appalachian traditions, hip hop, folk music, and they're all intertwined and they all um, are related in, in orally, but as well as um, just in, in myth and lore and in energetics. So that's a little bit about our album Ley Lines, which is available on vinyl. You're welcome to order it from our website, which is risingappalachia.com. And we have albums and all of these things are available online. Um, all the songs that we're singing today. Yeah, and then we love the herbal group Anima Mundi and uh, supporting women-led businesses. And she rocked this herbal medicine line for us. Um, we made a, a powder and a tea and a tincture, harmonize, resilient, and make magic are the names. And we're about to re-release them because um, they sold out. But she was amazing to work with. She's just a, a great healer and, and a, a magical witch herself. <laughs> So that was really cool to get to spread musical medicine on the road when we were on tour, but also share uh, physical herbal medicine with some of our fans. Good question. Thanks, y'all. Yay. All right. So I'm seeing some feedback that you guys are having a hard time hearing me. So let me ask you, can you hear me better right now with my headphones on? Um, or do you hear me better? now with my headphones off check 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 one two one two which one of those is better chloe you can let me know as well first was better first was better great maybe just try to have the the mic part somehow like <laughs> close to your mouth all right you know like all lean right. your head to the side or something Cool. I hear everyone is saying headphones better. Great. Thanks, you guys. Uh, it's amazing and hilarious to be both not techie <laughs> at all and to be trying to figure out how to make folk music on computer screens, which, you know, you are all learning how to do with herbalism and to be quarantined on a tiny farm in the highest point of Costa Rica with rainy season and Wi-Fi only if I stand in one particular place. So thanks for your patience and thanks for being here with us. Um, there's so many stories to tell, but I am going to just play another song and we'll go from there. And uh, this is a song that we wrote, a f it's a few albums old, and it's both a love song and a song about, um, you know, the power of our community. It's called Novels of Acquaintance. Met you over mountain moons, banjo riffs and fiddle tunes, and sugar river stay at Greek first, once now, twice now, every weekend. Lean in, beloved friend, bits of tender real meander. Tip the cup and pour the rubies, wild laughter, lust and beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
unto me with patience. I'll write you novels of acquaintance. Thank you, dear family, stepping up unanimously. Everywhere we've gone, we're home. Both for grace and grace was shown. It's boundless what we're in. Movements growing, spreading can you teach me treasure, grow me strong, and give me strength to every song. Yeah. Find to me with patience. I'll write you novels of acquaintance. Yeah, yeah. Find to me with patience. I'll write you novels of acquaintance. Dear quiet mystic neighbor, here's to trails and trails of paper. My firm-footed letter lover, you're the best thing I've discovered. And it's a love song, it's true. No hints, no riddles, no clues. And no threads, no strings, no bounding. Damn, baby, you make me grounded. I'd never be here without all your hands rejoice and shout and you who came broken weary sick step into the clearing let this be a moment healing i see you picture perfect rise together lose no faith that i've got you and you got me yeah yeah fine tune me with patience and I'll write you novels of acquaintance. Oh, yeah, yeah. Find to me with patience. I'll write you novels of acquaintance. Yay. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for being here. I'm pretty sure that that's our time and we want to make sure there's plenty of room for all of the amazing speakers and herbalists and all of us non-techie folks to just geek out on plants together. So there's Bevan, yay, and her tree forest. And uh, I'll answer some questions on the, on the chat thread for things that we weren't able to get to. So. Thank you so much for having us here. Yay. So that was amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking during this is just, you know, even with mediocre sound, I don't, I don't want to say anything mean, but like, you know, these are not fancy sound, uh, sound setups that these ladies have. The soul just comes through. I mean, I don't know if any of you weren't feeling it, but I'm, I can't imagine that you weren't. And that is an incredible thing about how, even if it's a little crackly or cutting in and out, it's just so real and it's so palpable. And, you know, we're all, if, you know, if you didn't feel connected before, those roots and rhizomes that are under our feet that are connected are just humming. And I know mine are, and I'm, super inspired and overwhelmed. So thank you, Leah and Chloe and Rising Appalachia. And that was, that was incredible. Um, so we're gonna move on to some other things which are maybe not as exciting, but also are as exciting. And, um, and you know, Mountain Rose herbs, it, you know, you might be familiar with them um, because you shop there and you love their stuff, but they are one of the most incredibly generous businesses. I don't work for them, by the way. Um, I'm just doing this for fun. And so they, you know, they're so generous and they support a lot of different people. 
um, everybody I know that's doing something good out there in the world is like, oh yeah, well, Mountain Rose also helps with this or in the herb world. Um, and so they just offer all of this support. And they support two organizations that are very near and dear to my heart and my personal reality. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what both of them are doing. You've probably heard of both of them, but if you haven't, oh, you're going to be so excited and tell you a little bit about some of the cool things that are happening. So we're going to start with the United Plant Savers. If you're not familiar with the United Plant Savers, we've been around for a long time and let's see, 25 years. Um, and this is a huge year. If you've been to Southeastern Ohio, you might have been to our sanctuary if you're one of the lucky people. So, so the, the United Plant Savers Sanctuary in Southeastern Ohio is akin to like Disney World for the average person. Um, it's like the place you want to go because all the really amazing, fun, heart-filled things can be found there. And, um, and it's just, you know, acres of golden seal and ginseng, all of this, and all the medicinal plants you want to see in this intact, beautiful forest. And this year, in the last year, we opened up the Center for Medicinal Plant Conservation, um, which is just this fantastic hub in an area that really needs a hub. So um, it's super easy to socially distance out there because there's like one person for every, you know, 50 acres or something. So get out there if you can. And so it was a big year with the Welcome Center. Um, that's been absolutely fantastic. Some other things that are really excited for, exciting for United Plant Savers. So you might, you know, you've all heard of like Certified Organic and you've all heard of um, Fair Trade and some of these others. But one of the other labels you might not heard of as much is Forest Grown Verified. And so this year, United Plant Savers became the, um, the oversight organization for the Forest Grown Botanical Program. Um, and that means that there's a network of forest farmers, as well as a handbook, there's forest farmers all over the country that you can see um, that little map with the sanctuaries, but there's also the forest farmers who are all over the place growing these medicinal plants in their forests in these intact ecosystems, um, which is just amazing. The more forest farming we can do, the better, because it keeps the forest whole. And um, and plants grow naturally and easily in their correct environment. So, so there's all of this amazing stuff going on with forest grown, um, certified and verified. And you can find out more about that if you go onto the United Plant Savers website or get in touch, uh, go out to the sanctuary, whatever, whatever you get to do, it's a pretty awesome thing. Some other things that are going on, the Golden Seal Summit actually already happened, but it is recorded and will be released soon really looking at the future of golden seal and um and you know these plants like herbalism is all about the plants without the plants we just wouldn't be doing what we're doing and uh, you know mountain reserves all of these great herb businesses all these great herbalists if we didn't have plants this would be impossible and while a lot of our plants are cultivated uh, a lot of them are not cultivated and a lot of them became cultivated because of pressures that they've faced due to over harvesting or um, habitat loss or so on. But so United Plant Savers focuses on that as an organization and it is a membership organization. So it'd be great for everybody to be a member. Um, your membership dollars go really to work to support these plants and all the work that we're doing. Um, you, there's also an amazing journal um, that looks at conservation around the world in medicinal plants. You can see this latest issue. And that's pretty exciting as we have, have more global reach. Um, we also have compendiums of all of our journals and just a lot of really great stuff that's going on. So, you know, if you get a chance to check out um, the United Plant Savers, you know, it's, it's a thriving organization. There's some fun events and, um, and you can really figure out a way to plug in. So, um, the other thing I wanted to mention is if you're looking to plug in locally, you're finding right now your world is really local on this earth, that there's a lot of things you can do with creating your own botanical sanctuary. You can try growing some of these plants as plant giveaways, things like that. So I mean, I just have a little, I have a little herb garden um, that kind of is always expanding, but I've got blue cohosh and black cohosh and golden seal and all these plants, wild yam, just happily growing in there. So they're really fun to grow and it's a, it's a pretty fantastic thing to check out. So definitely look into United Plant Savers. The other organization I wanted to mention is the American Herbalist Guild and I'm the current president of 
the American Herbalist Guild, and we're also a membership organization. Um, right now, herbalists are more relevant than ever. So, you know, it's a bit a very interesting time for herbalists. That, that right now people are really looking at herbal medicine um, as an important piece of wellness and health and our well-being. And so, you know, AHG is a membership organization. Also, we welcome anyone to be a member. Um, there's so many different things going on, really exciting to hear about it. But we have, um, you know, memberships for schools and all sorts of folks. We have public webinars, lots of different webinars in the archives that people, anyone who's a member can watch. Uh, student members. We have a special new category for elder members as a discounted category. Um, lots of intensives. We put out an amazing journal which really looks at herbalism. And, and as an organization, you know, our, we have a strong focus on, on um, diversity, equity, and inclusivity in the herb community. We have a long way to go with a lot of that work, but it's something that we spend a lot of energy and time on cultivating. Um, some other things about the HG I'd love to share is we have a COVID-19 resource page. So if you've heard about this virus, um, there is a, there's so many resources that herbalists are producing. And a lot of them aren't, you know, it are about what we know about the virus, what we know about our um, fellow herbalists in China and other parts of Asia who have already compiled information. Uh, around herbal medicine in this way. And so we have just kind of tried to create a one, one place that people can go. And so if you go to AmericanHerbalistSkill.com, you can see that COVID-19 resource page. It's freely available for anyone. You don't need to be a member. Um, you can check out what's up there. If you have some great resources, you can put them up there. But there's a lot of protocols for safety and things like that as well. If you're an herbalist in your community and you're looking at that, we're also putting out a pandemic webinar series to um, assist with some of the needs in our community right now. And that pandemic webinar series has a lot of different views of what's needed in herbalism. This is a sliding scale webinar series, so we're trying to make it accessible to everyone. Um, we're looking at everything from like therapeutic strategies to the role of the herbalist and in integrative healthcare around COVID-19. Um, we're looking at online teaching since a lot of herbalists are suddenly doing this online. We're looking at all sorts of clinical COVID updates with primary care um, and even like using herbs with unhoused folks that are especially hit hard during this pandemic. So we're trying to, to come at it from a variety of different ways. Um, check this out and you know, any, do what you can as far as a sliding scale. It all supports our, our nonprofit um, mission, vision and values. Um, the other piece is the idea around registered herbalist and um, what, why, why you see a registered herbalist. You know, the, the American Herbalist Guild strongly feels that herbalism is a right for all people. Um, you know, it, it's a not the, the registration of herbalists is about allowing certain herbalists, if they choose to do a registration, and also supporting the practice for all all herbalists of all types and paradigms. And so why herbalists? You can see this is a new website to promote some of the um, registered herbalists and RH if people are interested in do that, doing that. We also have a directory online. We are also coming out with a new membership category uh, this year, which will serve other herbalists um, of all different types. But you know, if you want to be a member, anybody can be a member, a student, a general member, anything like that. Lastly, I wanted to mention that we have an online symposium coming up. So if you've had fun with this and you feel like it's a little bit more high touch than you expected, you might be surprised at our symposium. We have a lot of really fun, really um, intimate community-based ideas on a pretty cool platform um, this year for our online symposium in October. So we hope you can join us for our symposium around narrative uh, herbalism and practice. And that is totally online. Next year will be in Colorado. And lastly, um, if you're choosing to be, if you're interested in being a member, that's our membership code, SAVE20, all caps. You can save $20 on your membership. So we'd love to have some new members from this. Lastly, thank you, Mountain Rose, for your continued support. Mountain Rose offers 20% off for all of the HG um, Folks, so if you're a member, that's another really cool thing that, um, that you can access.
So I do want to take a few minutes about um, answering questions. So if you want to add into that Q&A, you can go ahead and, and type some in there before we move on to our next talk. There's always lots of questions about the HG. So this is a great, or United Plant Savers, this is a great time to ask them. Um, so I do see a question about some resources on forest farming. I would go to the United Plant Savers website and there's that book there, the um, handbook for forest farming. That would be a great one. And I'm sure there's a lot of good free resources out there. Uh, let's see what other kinds of questions you have. You can, I'm gonna check the chat. You can also type in, yeah, the code is save 20. I see questions um, around what is some good online beginning classes. There's so many places to start with herbalism. This question has actually been coming in quite a bit right now. And um, some of my recommendations are that you, know, you can check out some of the free HD webinars. Um, I would look, ask in your community to find local herbalists. There's, there's actually herbalists, if you're herbalists of, of all different types, um, almost anywhere. And you might be surprised to find an herbalist right in your community. So I would start asking around. And it's a great question to ask Every, everywhere you go. You know, do you know an herbalist? You can also check the herbalist directory on the HG, but that's just gonna get the HG herbalist and there's a lot more herbalists. HG also has a chapter system that there's chapters in all different regions all around the country and you do not need to be a member. The chapters are for any herbalist who wants to come and participate. So you can find out if there's a chapter and plug in that way. Um, there's right there's lots of i i can see people in the chat you feel free to put in herbal schools that you love herbal schools that you've gone to um that's great to do that i there's too many and i love them all um and so we would be here too long if i was going to actually be recommending any specific ones but there's a lot of free resources and so try to get plugged into your community and get plugged into your online community is a great way to do it uh so yeah feel free to recommend your your schools. Um, somebody asked about an herbalist and an herbologist. I think that they're they're the same. I just like herbalist. It rolls off the tongue better. Um, a lot of people have been asking about books. What books you recommend? There. This is like a very dangerous question for herbalists because we like books almost as much as we like herbs. But um, if you're just getting started out, books by Rosemary Gladstar can be really great. But you can also just you know go and like open them up and see which ones talk to you. My, my suggestion is to spend as much time with plants as possible. It doesn't really matter where you live in the world, there's plants outside and those plants are generally herbs because a lot of these herbs are, are incredibly um, vital and resilient. I mean, when, when, when there's pavement and it starts to crack, it's herbs that grow up through that first. And so as herbalists and herb people and herbs, you know, we are really able to, um, to get out there and to push up through things. So yeah, I see lots of great, lots of great resources. So share those resources and inspire everybody and, um, and make sure that they know what's happening out there. So, all right. So I'm glad that you checked out UPS and HG, unitedplantsavers.com, americanherbalist.com, or americanherbalistscale.com. And right now, you know, things are kind of wacky and these organizations could really use your energy and your love and your help. And it doesn't have to be your money. I mean, they could totally use your money. Feel free to send them money. But, uh, but a lot of it is all about, you, you know, creating this wonderful awareness and this community. And these organizations are spread all around the country. They're made up of all sorts of different kinds of people. And it would be great to have, you know, more community and more people involved in all of them. So please check that out. Uh, I wanted to uh, answer one last question. Well, we'll see how many more come in, but it was asking about, do you need to be certified to be an herbalist? You don't. Um, anybody can be an herbalist in the United States. Um, we have that, it, we have inclusive laws around doing that. It's really a gray area more than anything, but as long as what you can't do is pretend to be a um, licensed healthcare provider and, uh, but you can be an herbalist. And so if you learn from your grandmother or grandfather, you learn from going to a university, you learn from an online program. Um, as long as you know your limits and you know what you're capable of and your intentions are good, you can be you can be an herbalist and you you know portray yourself um, accurately. So, all right. So we are going to go ahead and start to move on to the next piece, which I am really excited about. Also talking about learning. So herbalism and aromatherapy are intimately tied together. Um, so it gets really 
fun. And we are going to learn about aromatherapy with Christine Rice. And she's a certified aromatherapist. She is, she works at Mountain Reserves. I had to twist a lot of arms to find out some interesting things about her to share, but I found out that Christine is a dancer and she ended up at Mountain Rose Herbs because her dance instructor was actually um, a manager at Mountain Rose and she came on board and they still get to work together, which I think, I love the combination of plants and dancing and people. So I think that's fantastic. And Christine has been at Mountain Rose Herbs for over a decade. Uh, here she's like the in, she's like the human encyclopedia of all of the different products they have here. So you can probably like quiz her on the most obscure things that they sell. Um, no, don't do that. But you can do that if you want. <laughs> um, so enjoy your talk with with Christine. I'll be back afterwards to tell you about a little bit about what's next and to also wrap up together. Thanks for listening about these two nonprofits and uh, enjoy. Thanks, Bevan. I'm going to uh, move forward and share my screen now. And get the slideshow going. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first online for your Bullism project. Um, I also want to thank Mountain Rose Herbs for giving me the opportunity to present with you today. Uh, besides working with all of the products that we have at Mountain Rose, I'm really passionate about our essential oils. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get into the topics here. I've got a lot on the plate, so we'll see if we can cover it all. Um, as Bevan just said, I work at Mountain Rose. I'm the products manager and aromatherapist on staff. Um, I've been here for 15 years at this point and 10 of that has been working closely with our essential oils. Um, but the main thing I want to touch base on this slide here is the distillation picture down in the corner. Um, this is a distillation of German chamomile or blue chamomile. Um, they are working or extracting the hydrosol here, but you can also see the really rich blue essential oil that's coming out with it and kind of speckled on their um, separator right there as well. Just a fun little picture I like to share. Um, so today, some of the topics that we're gonna cover include what hydrosols and essential oils are, um, how they're made, what to look for when you're purchasing them, how to use them safely, um, storage tips and shelf life. And I wanna dive into a little bit of basic blending tips. Um, I'm gonna try and move through the rest of it as quickly as I can to spend some more time on the blending, but that's kind of a whole nother presentation on its own um, and something that I'm really passionate about. I actually added more blending tips this morning into the slideshow, so like I said, hopefully we'll get through all of it. Um, so what is aromatherapy is a big question that I hear a lot. We've got two definitions here, one from the National Association of Holistic Aromatherapy and one from the Alliance of International Aromatherapy. Um, both of these organizations are wonderful resources for both aromatherapy and essential oil information. I believe both of them also have directories of approved schools um, and then also some find aromatherapist tools as well. Um, but looking at both of these, what really comes to me is that you're kind of using scent to get through your day, um, whether that is topically or through um, inhalation and breathing. Uh, and in addition to aromatherapy, essential oils are also used in a lot of other things, like I said, skincare, um, the industry or the world of natural perfumes is really kind of blossoming right now. Um, and you can also use them for cleaning products around your house. So it's not just aromatherapy, but you kind of can in integrate them into your whole life. Um, so what is a hydrosol and an essential oil? Um, so they are made from plants and plants primarily make them to either maybe attract insects or deter predators. Um, they're I believe a secondary metabolic process for them, so it's not a primary. Um, they are naturally extracted with primarily in three different methods. Um, we'll go over there and go over all three separately. Uh, they can, they're usually extracted as just one botanical, but you are finding, I am finding more co-distillations out there these days where maybe someone is 
distilling lavender and clary sage at the same time. Um, in most cases, they smell good. Some cases they don't. Um, similar to dried valerian root, a lot of people think that smells like dirty feet. The essential oil does have a very similar scent. Um, but yeah, it's all personal preference. Now we're gonna dive into some of the distillation methods a little bit. This is just kind of a basic general sketch of a water-based distillation. Um, this is gonna be the most common method essential oils are extracted from. Uh, the general concept is over here on your left. You have a still with water which creates steam and plant material. Um, it moves over into a condenser where it gets condensed, the steam moves into a condenser where it gets cooled and condensed back into a liquid. And then the final step is a separation where you have your distillate or hydrosol and the essential oil actually separate. Um, and that's just a general concept there. They get a lot fancier sometimes, or they can just be this basic. Um, as I said, water-based extractions are the most common process uh, for essential oils. They also generate hydrosols for the other extraction methods that we are gonna talk about don't. Um, so you're gonna find things like your lemon balm, peppermint, lavender, um, frankincense are all gonna be a water-based extraction. Um, and with that, there are three different types of distillation. Uh, you have a pure steam distillation where all of the plant material is above the water and you're, the steam is just passing through. That's going to be a lot of your like leafy botanicals. There's also a pure water distillation where the plant material is actually in the water that's being warmed up. Um, in my experience, that's a lot some of the more dense roots are gonna be in a pure water distillation. Um, and then you have one where plant material is in both the water and where the steam is gonna pass through. Um, and it really depends on the plant, on what type of distillation. I would say the steam is gonna be the most common one you see. Um, like I said earlier, all three of those water-based distillations result in a hydrosol and an essential oil. Um, the essential oils are the non-water soluble constituents from the plants, and then the hydrosols also have the water soluble constituents. Um, and because of this, the same plant can actually produce two very different scents in the essential oil and the hydrosol. Um, another thing, one thing to keep in mind with water-based distillations is that there's a lot of talk out there about a low temperature distillation. Um, and in reality, you need to make steam, and in order to make steam, you do need to reach 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so I like to just kind of keep reminding people that, or keep that in mind when you see talk about low heat distillations. Um, and lavender is actually a perfect example where the hydrosol does not smell like the essential oil. Um, for angustifolia, the essential oil is really sweet and floral, um, has a lot of bright notes. And then the hydrosol itself is actually very vegetal and green. Um, that is one that people don't expect, like they expect it to smell like lavender, um, but it's not always the case. And in addition to lavender, there's also multiple species out there. So you could actually be smelling two different plants. The next extraction method um, is a cold pressed extraction and we're going to talk about this photo in a little bit. Um, this is your main extraction method for citrus peel oils. Um, so your sweet orange, bergamot, lime peel. Um, in general, the fruits are punctured and pressed and then they go through a couple other processes to kind of separate the oil from any juice or pith or plant material. Um, usually through a centrifuge. The, there are steam distilled citrus oils on the market that you can find. Those are typically used for fragrance and flavorings. Um, so when we look at this photo over here, this darker oil is actually a cold pressed lime oil. And this clear oil is the distilled lime oil. Um, and they actually, besides just the color difference, they have two different scents. So the cold pressed one is going to smell like cutting into a fresh lime and the distilled 
extracts different constituents and you're gonna it kind of smells like lime candy so it's like i said those are usually used in the flavoring industry a little bit more the third type of extraction is a sol solvent extraction and that is what gives us our absolutes um, this method usually is used on like really flag fragile flowers who can't stand up to the heat or plant materials that aren't water soluble. Um, jasmine and vanilla are good examples of this. So with the solvent extraction, there's actually two different steps. The first extraction um, gives you the oil and the waxes from the plant, and that's what is found as a concrete on the market. Um, and then from there, there's a secondary extraction where they take the wax out, and then you have the waxes and then your oily absolute. So absolutes are not technically essential, essential oils, but they are still used in the same way. Um, when used in aromatherapy, they're usually used for scent. A lot of times they're used for fragrance and perfume blending. They can be quite thick um, because of the way they're extracted. Uh, a lot of times you, if a lot of times they are blended with other products, so they're a little easier to use. Um, we do have some of our absolutes that are blended and that's clearly stated on our website and on our labeling. Um, and even then they can still be a little thick. So you can always kind of rub the bottle between your hands to warm it up or place it in some warm water. Um, I've even heard of people using a hair dryer to kind of heat up the whole bottle and kind of liquefy the, or the absolute a little bit more. Um, but they're fun to work with. Don't be afraid of them just because they're solvent extracted. Uh, we do not produce the essential oils and hydrosols that we offer at Mountain Rose, but we do work with experts in the craft. Um, this image here is of a large scale stainless steel operation for essential oils, um, where this image here are copper alembic stills. The smaller one in the front is, I think, a 20 liter, and I believe the ones in the back here are 150 liters, and you can see the big column that's kind of tipped right there so they can fill it with water and plant material. Um, this image is from one of the hydrosol companies that we work with, one of the small farms who grow and produce their product. Uh, so now I'm going to dive into hydrosols a little bit more and cover some more specifics there. Um, so what is a hydrosol? It's also known by some other names on the market, including flower waters, aromatic waters. Um, sometimes you just see them sold as rose water, lavender water. Uh, they're also called distillates. And again, they're the water part of the distillation. And so hydrosols are picking up in popularity right now and there's a lot more small crafters out there you can buy some of those smaller stills and make your own hydrosols at home using small amounts of plant material um, i'm even seeing some people distilling non-aromatic plants like nettle or skullcap and using them in other ways besides just for scent so when purchasing hydrosols there's a few things you want to look for um, the common plant name and the Latin name. With most botanical products, a lot of times there can be multiple Latin names and the same common name. So you want to make sure wherever you're getting your hydrosol from is that they're listing both of them. Um, you want to know the plant part so that you're are getting what you expect. Um, and you also want to check for purity. Hydrosol should be 100% hydrosol. If they're not, they should have an ingredient list. Um, and you want to make sure that it's not water with essential oil added to it and that it is an actual distillate. Um, color is another good one. Most hydrosols are clear. There are a few that are kind of off-white, but in my experience, it's going to be a clear hydrosol. And also, when purchased anything botanical, you want a lot number so that you can always go back to the supplier if there's something wrong with it. We do offer a couple of hydrosols that we add a preservative to to prolong the shelf life. Um, and again, that's going to be clearly listed on our ingredient list and our website. 
So what we're looking for as far as quality goes with the hydrosols that we offer, um, we do test all of them in our in-house quality control lab before they're approved for bottling. Um, we sam sample and hold retention samples for all of them as well so we can look back if anything comes up. Um, we are looking for organoleptic testing, so we're looking at them visually, are they clear, are they cloudy, are there floaties, um, and then we're also comparing them to the last lot aromatically that we receive so that we can offer a consistent product. Um, and for the hydrosols, we also perform microbial testing, including bacteria and yeast and mold. Um, essentially, hydrosols are distilled water, so as long as supplier or as long as crafters are using clean equipment and nothing goes wrong, they should be free of microbial or activity. Safety for hydrosols is a, is a good one. Um, they're much easier to work with for essential oils. If you're just kind of getting into using aromatics in your life, uh, they can be used straight without diluting just as is um, directly on the skin. And they naturally contain less than 1% essential oil, if any, in most cases. Some fun ways to use include single ingredient facial toners or body mists. Um, our three ounce hydrosol actually comes in a glass bottle with a mister for that main purpose. Um, you can also add essential oils to it if you want, but you can just mist as is with that. Uh, a good example for that would be the chamomile. Um, they can also be used as a replacement in most recipes. Um, body care recipes, I like to use them in my diffuser instead of water sometimes. Um, you can use them in your cleaning recipes to add more scent. And um, I've even seen people simmer some in the, in the pot over their wood stove over the winter to kind of humidify the air. Shelf life on hydrosols is a lot different than essential oils. Um, I would suggest keeping or using them up in one to one and a half years after your date of purchase. Um, they're typically distilled once a year from fresh material. Um, so you wanna keep that in mind. So depending on what time of year you are buying, that means it could already be aging a little bit. Um, so you can always request production dates from your supplier. Um, for storage, hydrosols can be kept in plastic or glass. Um, they're fine in either. They're an aqueous product. Always in a control, temperature controlled closet or shelf. Um, mine are in a closet in the hallway. Out of direct sunlight. And some people do store them in the refrigerator to prolong their shelf life. That's not my favorite storage for the hydrosol as long knowing that I have it in a closed closet, but that is also an option. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is they can freeze. Um, so that's something with purchasing in the winter is sometimes they can freeze during shipping. This can cause breakage with the glass or even some leakage with plastic bottles. Um, but it doesn't ruin the hydrosol as long as your bottle doesn't explode, which hopefully it doesn't. Um, you can just let it thaw and still use it just the same. Now moving on to essential oils a little bit. Um, you can see here in the image, there is a wide range of colors for essential oils. I would say that this image is a little extreme. Um, my guess is that these two are some sort of citrus oil. This one could be as well. It might be vetiver. Um, this is probably a cinnamon. But in most cases, you're going to see an oil that's closer to this. Um, it's kind of clear or almost colorless. So our essential oils that we offer are one of the largest certified organic selections on the market and we're constantly looking for new organic crafters to work with. Um, we do also have a healthy selection of absolutes, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. When purchasing essential oils, you want to look for some of the same things that you do with hydrosols or any botanical um, that you're buying, whether it's an herb or a tincture common name and Latin name. Uh, plant parts gonna be really important for essential oils. There's a lot of plants that are, they distill separate parts. For example, you have cinnamon bark and cinnamon leaf oil. Um, the bark is a 
a little more difficult to work with and it causes more skin irritation. Um, so I would recommend a cinnamon leaf for something that you're using topically. Uh, we also have citrus orontium, which gives us bitter orange from the peel, uh, pettigrain from the leaf and twigs, and neroli or orange blossom from the flowers. So plant part is always going to be really important when you're purchasing essential oils. Um, you do want to know the extraction method. I think the biggest point for that is going to be with your citrus peel oils. Um, Purity is another one. Again, if it's blended with anything, you should have an ingredient list. Um, if there's not one, the product name suffices for the contents. And lot number for everything, just so you can keep track of things. Another thing to look out for when you're buying is the term therapeutic grade, which is misleading. It's really just a marketing term. Um, unlike certified organic products or non-GMO verified products, therapeutic grade does not have a certifying body that has, looks at the product and looks at the constituents and confirms that it's going to be beneficial in any way. For quality on the essential oils, um, similar to our hydrosols, we do test them all in-house. Our main testing method is organoleptic testing on every batch. Um, this includes aroma, color, clarity, and sometimes tactile sensation. Essential oils don't all feel the same. Some of them are really tacky. Some of them are kind of slippery. Some evaporate really quickly. Um, and then we also, at the moment, work with a third-party lab for GCMS testing to verify plant identity and look for any unwanted additives. Oops. And we offer certificates of analysis upon request for every oil that we offer. Um, these include all of the labeling points that we talked about earlier, um, country of origin, production dates, appearance and odor descriptions, and then any other testing results that we might have done in-house or are provided from supplier certificates of analysis. There's a few slides on safety for the essential oils. Um, and I don't want them to scare you, but they are made of hundred, hundreds of constituents and considered chemicals. Um, they're very highly concentrated plant-based products. Uh, if you think about 10 pounds of fresh peppermint, it's really only gonna give you about a tablespoon of peppermint essential oil. Um, so that's a really, really condensed product there. Uh, because of this, if they're not properly used, they can cause damage to your mucous membranes. Um, if used incorrectly over time, they can cause liver failure. We label all of our essential oils for external use only. Um, and this is mandated by the American Herbal Products Association Code of Ethics, who we work very closely with. Um, and this is their code of ethics for undiluted essential oils. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about dilution in the next few slides. You always wanna dilute before um, putting anything on your skin. There are some higher dilutions than the one to 2% that we recommend. Um, and if you wanna do anything higher, I, you need to go see a qualified healthcare practitioner to make sure you're doing things safely. Uh, you wanna avoid contact with your eyes and mucous membranes. Um, when blending, I suggest wearing gloves or eye protection. And if you're blending for a prolonged period of time, um, I would also suggest making sure you're in a well-ventilated open area um, or even just take breaks to walk outside if you need to. It can be a little overwhelming. Um, exceptions to that would maybe be when you're adding drops of oil to a diffuser. You don't need to get all gloved up for that. Um, I really stand behind our labeling of not for internal use on essential oils. I feel like there are a lot of other products that you can use if you wanna take herbs internally. Um, herbal teas, alcohol extracts and tinctures are all great options. Um, I really don't think anyone needs to be taking essential oil internally. And some more safety. <laughs> Um, you do want to be cautious diffusing or cleaning with essential oils around pets. Um, I'm not saying don't do it, but maybe don't spray some cleaning surface cleaner right next to where your cat sleeps while they're taking a nap. Um, 
It's really hard on cats' livers, essential oils especially. Um, I would never use an essential oil on your cat. There are also some, some safe uses for dogs, but I'm finding that more people are using hydrosols when they're working with dogs or even horses and not necessarily essential oils. Um, Aroma Web here is a great resource for safety with using on pets um, and just a great resource in general for essential oils. There is also um, a few online courses that you can take if you want, if you're interested in using essential oils for pets. Um, I would never use them on your infant. Um, and you do want to be careful using them around children. There are safe ways to do it. Uh, I would check with your healthcare practitioner for proper dilutions on that. Um, and we reference the essential oil safety guide by Tisserand and Young for all of our warnings that we list on the website and on our labels, but it isn't all inclusive. So I do encourage you to research more if you plan on using an essential oil often. Unlike hydrosols, essential oils have a really long shelf life. Um, they, if stored properly, they can last for years. The only exception to that I would say would be cold pressed citrus oils. Um, they tend to oxidize a little quicker, so I would only keep those around for one to two years. Um, the reducers on the essential oils do tend to break down if you have them for a long time, so I always like to keep a few extra on hand. Um, and if I notice that some of the plastic on the reducer is breaking down, I just go ahead and change the lid on my bottles. Um, that is something that you can see happen. Um, and if an oil is getting old, you could use it in cleaning products, but I wouldn't recommend using it in skincare products anymore. Um, and how do you know if it's old? I would go with your instincts. Um, if it doesn't smell right, don't use it. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that essential oils are hazardous waste. So you need to, do need to contact your local sanitation department um, for proper, or proper disposal on them. As far as storage goes, you should always store essential oils in glass. Um, like I said, the reducers can break down, but if you store them in plastic, the essential oils can also break down that plastic, absorb into it, um, and even react to the plastic sometimes. Um, same as hydrosols, you want to store in a temperature controlled place out of direct sunlight. And some people do refrigerate their essential oils, especially some of the citrus oils. Um, you do want to keep in mind that they could solidify, which in some cases is a sign of quality. Um, so yeah, again, just rubbing them between your hands or pulling them out and putting them, having them at room temperature for a little bit before you use them is going to be the best on that. Uh, okay. Some ways to use essential oils, and what I would say is probably the easiest, is in an aroma spray. Um, that can be used as both a personal body spray or something that you spray in your space. Um, we do have lots and lots of recipes on our blog, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, they can also be added to your DIY body care. Um, you do always want to dilute when you're putting them on your skin. And here are just some general percentages that I would suggest. Um, massage oils are covering a larger part of your body, so I would use something closer to a 1%, maybe even less. Um, topical applications can be 2% and facial care between 1 and 2, depending on what you're doing. Um, sensitive skin would be good around 1% as well, but you can play with it. These are just general suggestions. Um, the majority of the time, I never go over 2% on anything. It's just not needed. Um, so what does that mean? So when we're talking about a carrier oil, one ounce of carrier or two tablespoons is really only needs six drops to make a 1% and 12 drops to make a 2% dilution. <coughs> Excuse me. We do have two great tools on our blog. Um, we, one, we have a conversion chart, which will adjust measurements for you. So it'll take you from teaspoons to drops or to full ounces if you need, depending on how you're working with your product. Um, 
And then we also have a dilution calculator. Uh, the thing I want everyone to keep in mind with that is that it's calculating how much essential oil to add to the carrier or total amount that you put in. It's not calculating the essential oil that goes into a total amount. Um, so when you're doing larger volumes, it doesn't look like it's accurate, but it's calculating what you should add to the number that you enter. <clears throat> and they're both very user friendly. You can choose between different units of measure um, and I encourage you to check those out. So what is a carrier? It's kind of a general term um, <clears throat> when blending with oils. So organic vegetable or carrier oils are really popular. Um, sweet almond or jojoba are very neutral scents as well as sunflower oil. Um, olive oil is really easy to find, but you can also get, you're gonna expect some of that scent to come through. Um, blending with an oil is gonna give you a ready to use product that should stay combined with your essential oil. Some other carriers that you can use would include distilled water, um, organic witch hazel extract, organic hydrosols, unscented creams or lotions. Um, and we do have a blog that covers all of these topics in more detail. Something to keep in mind when you're working with an aqueous carrier, so water, hydrosols, is that the essential oils don't blend into water. They're not water soluble. Um, so you can put them in and shake them really good right before use to kind of disperse the essential oils. There are emulsifiers that you can get out there that will actually help emulsify the oil into the water. Um, I personally haven't found one that I like yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we are on the hunt for an emulsifier, but like I said, not the, not, uh, not the perfect one yet to add. <clears throat> So a few more ways to use essential oils are in a diffuser. This is a really popular, easy way to diffuse or to work with oils and just have them scent your space. On our website, you can find videos for all of our diffusers. And then I believe we also have a blog that describes a lot of them. There's an overwhelming number of options to choose from. <clears throat> So one of the popular ones that we have now is an ultrasonic diffuser. You can find them all over the place. Um, they're good for larger rooms. They use water to create mist and they dispense without heat. They typically have a plastic interior. A lot of times all of them are made out of plastic <clears throat> and they have different mist settings, um, intermittent and continuous settings usually. And then also some LED light options that you can turn on and off. They usually have an automatic shut off and that's either going to be when your mist setting is done or sometimes if the diffuser runs out of water, it will turn off as well. <clears throat> Ceramic diffusers are a nice option for small rooms. <clears throat> they use a tea light to create heat and they're plastic free. Some things to keep in mind with these is that they do get hot because of the flame that's being used, um, like actually hot to the touch. And then also you're working with a burning candle, so you want to be careful you don't walk out of the room and just leave it burning for a while. My favorite diffuser is a waterless electric diffuser. Um, they're good for medium to large rooms. They don't have any water. You add essential oil directly to the glass here. <clears throat> and they're really easy to clean. You can just pour some rubbing alcohol or pure grain in there and mix it around, clean out the essential oil, and then just let it air dry. Similar to the ultrasonic diffusers, these also have inter usually have intermittent cycles, um, LED lights, and then the same automatic shutoff. <laughs> Now we have some time to go into the blending basics. Um, oops. And the thing that I want to stress with blending is that it's not an exact science. It's not perfect. 
And a lot of it is just kind of personal preference and a lot of playing. Um, so essential oils in general are classified into three different note types. We have top notes, middle or body notes, and base or fixative notes. And the thing with this is one oil isn't always just one type of note. You have some bases uh, that are also a middle note, or you have some top notes that are also a middle note. And so it's not, it really depends on how you're blending to what sort of life and an aroma these oils take on. Um, a balanced blend will most likely contain all three types of notes, but again, it's going to be dependent on what you're using. You may end up with a blend that's all top and middle notes and it's still very balanced. Um, here are just general percentages on what your oil types might consist of and what your notes kind of come out as. And you always want to start small when you're blending. Um, I usually try to keep my blends to less than 20 drops of oil total when I'm working with them until I find something I really like. And an important thing to keep in mind is to write everything down. So you can either recreate blends that you love or avoid cre recreating blends that you don't love so much. We're gonna go through and talk about the different notes and their qualities a little bit. Um, when we talk about scents, we talk about from the top note down to the base. However, when I'm blending, I usually start with my base or heavier notes and blend up. Um, and that just helps develop the blend a little bit more. But when we're smelling something, we're going to smell the top notes first. Um, that's going to be your first impression. They're usually really bright and sharp um, and they evaporate quickly. So some of the favorites out there are lavender, um, neroli, pedigree and juniper, in my opinion, kind of tend between a top and a middle note, but they all have those sort of like bright, refreshing scents to them. Middle notes are gonna be the body. I think my slide's back towards here. Yep, <laughs> they're also referred to as the body notes. Um, and they are kind of the main part of your aroma or your scent. <clears throat> they have a rounded scent sometimes. And some favorites are clary sage, elemy, geranium, uh, rosemary. And again, all of these, depending on what you're doing, could act as more of a base note or a top note in your blends. Base notes are also referred to as fixative or dry out notes. They're kind of the heaviest molecules in your blend or in an oil. Um, and the reason why you want to have a balanced blend is that those base notes are gonna hold on to your top notes and kind of make them last longer so they don't evaporate as quickly. And they're the last notes to dissipate when you're doing a whole scent profile. Sometimes all of your base notes are gone within five to eight hours. Sometimes they kind of hold on to a they can last for days afterwards. Um, they don't always have a strong scent. Some of my favorite bases include Amorous, which has a very um, soft scent, but still gives you that fixative aspect that you're looking for in a blend um, and holds down the top notes that you might be working with. Um, some classic base notes, like I said, Amorous, Atlas Cedarwood does have a stronger scent. Some people, don't actually find it very pleasant. Um, it's kind of like sweet, bittersweet and dry. Um, and then vetiver is a, also a base note that has a strong sort of tenacious scent to it. Some blending tips that I like to want to just pass on um, that I find really helpful. <clears throat> Again, always start small. When I'm blending, I actually blend in a little eighth ounce bottle um, and then also keep it, try to keep it under 20 drops um, until I find something that I really like. Um, I tend to take the reducers out of my bottles and use glass droppers when I'm blending. I'm finding, I find that that's a little easier to work with instead of trying to hold a bottle upside down and control the drops coming out of those reducers. Um, you can either use a glass dropper and clean it with alcohol, or you can find plastic disposable droppers out there. Um, and then you can just pop your reducer cap back in and use it for later. 
like I said earlier, I like to work from the bottom up. Um, when I am blending with the bottom and the base notes, I really only start with one or two drops. And then as you increase and get higher in your scent profile, you're gonna add a little bit more. So one to two drops of your bases, maybe five to six of your middle notes. And depending on your top note, you might add seven or eight drops to just that initial blend. Before I even start blending, I like to spend some time with each oil that I wanna work with. So I just kind of take the time to sit and smell each one of them, appreciate what they smell like on their own. Um, and sometimes if I'm really stuck, I just sit in front of my oils and just start smelling them to see what speaks to me and what I might wanna blend together. Um, I think it's really important to kind of recognize what each oil smells by itself before you start building them together. Sometimes I just walk away. <laughs> it's good if a blend just isn't working, I don't think you should force it. Kind of just set it aside to work on it later. Um, I have little bottles all over the place of stuff that I've started and haven't come back to, um, stuff that I just never liked and I'm hoping I might like them some other time. Uh, but yeah, it's okay to walk away. Blends aren't just gonna happen right away or in one sitting. I also encourage you to smell them at different times of the day or even single essential oils as well. You might really like something first thing in the morning, but maybe after lunch or later in the evening, it's a scent that you just don't find appealing. Um, and the last thing is really just to have fun. Um, I think a lot of people are scared to blend oils together, but as long as you're working with small quantities, um, you can't go wrong, you're not wasting a lot of material, and you might find something that you really like. Okay, and I, that is about it for the slides. I see that I probably should have had some time to bring some oils in, um, but that takes a little bit longer as well. I am seeing a few questions here, so I'm gonna go ahead and look at some of these questions and see what we can talk about a little bit more. Oh, here's a good one asking about therapeutic, or I have heard that there's no such thing as therapeutic essential oils or that is actually not better than organic. I'm wondering what the actual difference is. We did touch base on that a little earlier. Um, a therapeutic oil is just a marketing term in most cases. Um, organic is a certified oil that a governing body is looking at and verifying. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else. There's a lot of great questions in here. Oh, and you're adding more, which is moving things around. This is great. I just saw one about fractionated coconut oil. Where did it go? Um, I do like fractionated coconut oil. We actually use that as the base in our new roll-on, diluted roll, essential oil roll-ons um, and in our aroma oils. The thing that's nice about it is that it is a neutral oil. Um, it's completely clear, it doesn't have a scent, and is the, fract the difference between the fractionated coconut oil and a unrefined or refined coconut oil is that it's liquid, so it's easier to work with. <clears throat> Let's see, kind of get through some more of these here. Oh, actually, there's a good question in here about using fat to create jasmine absolute. And that is actually an extraction method that we didn't talk about today. And it's called enflorage. Um, it's where you use solid fats or oils and layer flowers in between them. Um, and then similar to 
And sometimes you refresh the layers and add more flowers and then just let it sit and let the fats pull out um, the aromatic compounds from the plant material. Similar to absolutes, those are then gonna have to go through another process to remove the fats and extract the oils. I don't have a whole lot of experience working with those at all, um, but that is a method of extraction that is out there. Um, I have someone looking for a diffuser for a small living space. Um, we do have some smaller ultrasonic diffusers that are good for a small space. Um, there's also uh, electric pad diffusers, which I didn't talk about today. And they're, they're rather small. And then you put essential oil on an absorbent pad and they use a fan, a, a fan and sometimes heat to blow the essential oil into the air. Um, those are both good for small spaces. Same with the ceramic diffusers that we offer. Um, but again, if you don't wanna work with candles, that's probably not gonna be your, your best choice. <clears throat> Let's see, lots of questions in here. Thank you, everybody. Oh, here's a good one about oregano essential oil. Um, they're saying that it changed color from light to dark. This can happen sometimes. It doesn't mean that you don't need to use it anymore um, or that it's expired. Some essential oils do change in time with color and as they age, um, it could, they do oxidize as well, but color change isn't usually associated with that. Um, and as well, we're talking about aging essential oils. There are a few oils that are thought to improve with age. Um, so vetiver, for example, and patchouli, you can find aged oils on the market because they have different qualities over time. Um, let's see. There seems to be a few questions around essential oils and using them for skincare. Yes, you can use them for skincare, um, but you wanna make sure you're using a diluted product. Um, earlier I talked, mentioned not using them for your skin undiluted. So you wanna make sure you're blending it in something. Um, they're actually amazing. Amazing for skincare. Um, just have alcohol added to it. Again, it's one of those really thick absolutes that need, that are actually solid um, and it needs something else in it to work with. It's not the best, those make interesting, um, interesting to use. The, uh, the benzoin could work in a diffuser. Um, it might look a little funny or separate in the water a little bit because it is actually only alcohol soluble. And let's see, I'm just gonna take a couple more questions here. I see one on how many drops to use in bath water, um, which is a really good question. If you're gonna add essential oils to your bath, the best way to do it is actually gonna be in a bath salt or maybe even added to milk. Um, I don't recommend just dropping essential oils into your bath because they're not gonna blend in with the water. They're just gonna kind of float on the top. Um, and I'm just going to scroll back up to the top here and see if there are any other questions. Might just answer one more really quick and then hand it back to Bevan here. Hmm. Yep, oh, here's a good one. Back to vetiver and thick essential oils. Vetiver is an extremely thick oil. Um, it's a pure distillation. It's not blended with anything else. Um, so it can be very hard to work with. Again, if you wanna rub it in between your hands, 
maybe let it sit in a bowl of warm water for a little bit, or even sometimes um, I've seen people use a hair dryer to kind of heat the oil. And that is it for today on my end. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all of your amazing questions. Um, I do believe we are recording this and it should be available later. Um, and again, thank you everyone. I'm gonna pull Bevan back in if she wants to come back. Bevan? <laughs> Hi, that was great. <laughs> Learning about essential oils and yeah, so many things to learn about. Such fascinating parts of plants. Let's get my screen back up here. Um, and oh, here we go. Okay. You got lots of nice comments in the Q and A box. And as people have been asking, will this be recorded? It will be recorded mm -hmm. and it is recorded and it will be out. Uh, just give it a little bit of time to get in there and edit it and change it. And so thank you, Christine, so much for, for this. It was really enjoyable. And if you wanna answer any of those questions in the question box, you can always type the, the answer as well. Okay. So I'm keeping an eye on that. If you have more questions, people can, can feel free to uh, go ahead and ask those. So we're going to move on. And when Mason asked me to do this, it, I was so excited. I just thought, well, this is perfect, you know, to, to get a chance to connect with everybody and to, uh, to be part of such a fantastic event with so many people. And, and it was a time when, you know, just finalizing the schedule, figuring things out. And I had a dream that night. And the dream, Mason was very mundane. He just sent me this list that said, our new schedule is out and can you just make sure it looks good and on it it had me telling tractor jokes for 20 minutes and i remember looking at it and being like wow that's that's unusual so i messaged mason and my dream and said um what's the deal with the tractor jokes and he said it's a long time a long time um tradition at this event and i was like oh okay but i don't know any he's like don't worry you'll be fine so so i'm not going to tell you tractor jokes but i'm going to tell you a couple plant jokes for fun because laughing is good. Um, these are all pretty bad. And of course, none of them are offensive. So, you know, we had to cut out all those other ones. But here's, here's some good ones. Okay. What did one hungry plant say to another? Anybody know? I should keep the chat open in case anybody actually knows the answer. So what did one hungry plant say to another? I could use a light snack. Get it? A light snack. This is so weird without people actually there to laugh. Okay. Um, and so another one is, here's a pun. This one, you have to be, uh, you have to be sharp to get this one at first. I read it like three times. So after winter, trees are relieved. You get it? Relieved. They're relieved and they're relieved. Ah. Okay. One more. Last one. <laughs> the last one is what is the most Frightening plant. This is good for those of you who have kids at home. Bamboo. Okay. <laughs> I won't put you through any more of that. Um, so a last few things today. And one of them is that Mason strongly encouraged me to go for some kind of blatant self-promotion. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm really excited. My first book is coming out on June 23rd. It's called Spice Apothe Apothecary. And it is about the therapeutic power of spices used in dietary applications. So not just like what it's good to put a little cinnamon in your oatmeal or something, but really how to use large amounts or therapeutic amounts of spices and herbs, culinary, in your food. Um, and there's a lot of interesting evidence. It's super pretty and I'm so excited. So you can buy it anywhere you like to buy books. That's um, totally available, you know, all over the place coming out on June 23rd. If you want to spend more money on it, <laughs> you can buy it directly from the author at the URL on the screen, bevanclair.com. And I am sending the first 200 people a little um, cognitive supporting spice blend. So that's, um, that's exciting with it. And I'll do a custom inscription. So anyways, that was embarrassing and I'm really excited. And I hope that, uh, that you can check it out wherever you like to get books. So that is at bevanclair.com and it's called Spice Apothecary. And yeah, so that's exciting, but not as exciting as this next part. 
So this is a little bit in our closing. Um, what we'd like to do, what I'd like to do is have all of us go in an herb walk with Steven Yeager. So I'm thinking that either we could all try to teleport. Teleporting sounds really simple. Um, or we could, I could take my giant flying dandelion um, pappus out so that I have a flying dandelion thing. I can fly all around the world, pick everybody up. You can all join me on our big dandelion flower and then we'll go for a plant walk. But seriously, we can't do it that way. So instead of the flying dandelion or teleportation, we are going to use YouTube. And Steven Yeager ha and team has uh, kindly created this wonderful YouTube plant walk so you can get out there. And we decided that this is a great thing that you can, you know, you can get, you can watch this a little later, you can watch it right now, you can get friends and family together, you can watch it 40 times, um, you can do whatever you want with it this way. And it's available right there. And uh, you can see that YouTube URL. Maybe Mason, you could put that in the chat or um, something like that or send it out to, yeah, send it out to all panelists through the chat or someone could do that and then everybody could click on it. So, um, so that's our next plan is we're gonna do that. But, but when we do this, the other thing we can do, you know, I've been talking since the beginning and those of you came in a little late, um, the idea that plant people are connected because plants are connected. We have rhizomes, we have roots, we have a network that spreads all across the country. Every single one of us has, plant, has roots beneath our feet. Even if you have to drop down, you know, 15 stories in an apartment building, there are roots down there. And those roots connect with roots, connect with roots. Um, and there's this whole relationship. And so, you know, you can connect through this way. This network is always here, connects you to plants, and it connects you to plant people. And what I think would be a great thing to do is to spend a little bit more time doing some tree cuddles. Since I haven't had as many hugs and can't go out and hug people. I'm into hugging trees. I mean, I've always been into hugging trees, but I'm like super into hugging trees right now. And so we, I just go out for hikes and like it's one tree to another, but it is amazing. I mean, I know it's a total cliche and you're all probably rolling your eyes, but if you haven't hugged a tree before, you should definitely do it. And if you have, you, you know, each one is amazing. And each time you do that, you connect in to this amazing, incredible network of plants and plant people and connection and they're just alive so there's a great comfort in it and you can't get sick or anything like that um, from them so hug them and kiss them and i do like hugs like with my legs up wrapping around them and everything so please get out there that's one way we can all connect with each other kind of bring some of this spirit out into nature with us all of this connection that we've found today so Definitely take care of yourselves, feel connected. You're not alone out there. Go on this plant walk with Steven Yeager and have a great time with that. Breathe deeply, hug a tree and connect with everyone. And thank you, a deep thank you to Mountain Rose and everyone there for putting this on today, for bringing us all together, for you know, making it possible and for just you know, the world to be, to be like this. So make those connections, everyone. It was really great to be here with you. Um, thank you for all of your vitality. I, know you, I don't know if you, how much you can see the chat and how many people are on here, but it is huge and our community is thriving. So have a great afternoon and evening. Enjoy your plant walk and take care. Bye, go hug a tree. <laughs> <laughs>